every cancer is a case of clonal evolution. Evolution is involved in every single patient who develops cancer. Now cancer evolution is a different kind of evolution in the sense that it's short-sighted and it's selfish. The clones originate through mutations and then they compete for resources and for space within the patient. Two of the key genes that in, are involved are P16 and P53. They control the cell cycle and DNA repair, among other things. And damage to DNA repair increases mutation rate. The greater the genetic diversity in a tumor, the more likely that it will progress to malignancy. So cancer evolution is not something that is passed from a parent to an offspring with very, very few exceptions. There are, there's a, a tumor in Tasmanian devils and there's one other that can actually be transmitted. But 99.99% .99 of all cancers are not passed from parents to offspring. Their entire evolution occurs within the body and the lifespan of a single individual human being. Their evolution is short-sighted because they die with their hosts. Here, selection is operating on cell clones over no more than about 40 to 50 cell generations. And that's not enough selective events to produce any precise adaptation, but it can produce a rough adaptation to a local environment. So a metastasis to a liver, for example, can have different characteristics than a metastasis to a lung, and you can show that those differences have something to do with those two environments. This lovely uh, picture is from Charlie Nunn. Somatic evolution is actually orthogonal to germline evolution. So this green tree down here shows births of, for example, your birth, the birth of your children, the birth of your grandchildren. And then each individual looks like a tree. These are all of the somatic cells that are growing up out of the single cell of the zygote. And a cancer is going to be a branch or a twig on one of these trees. It's produced by competition among clonal lineages generated by somatic mutation. And these, lineage these lineages are extremely genetically heterogeneous. And that's been detected with many methods. There are changes that range from nucleotide sequences and methylation patterns to chromosome numbers. Cancer cells are competing for nutrients and to evade the immune system. And the genetic variants that are better at those functions increase in number and frequency. So there are two very important things going on here. One is that there's a huge amount of genetic diversity being generated. And the second is that that genetic diversity is being trimmed and shaped by competition. So it's a standard microevolutionary scenario where genetic variation is the fuel for a selection process. The two genes in which mutations are particularly important are P16, which is also called CDKN2A. This is a cyclene-dependent kinase inhibitor. It produces two splicing variances. One of them inhibits CDK4 kinase, which is important for cell cycle progression, and the other stabilizes P53 by sequestering a protein that degrades P53. P53 produces a transcription factor that regulates cell cycle and also suppresses tumor formation. It can activate DNA repair proteins, it can arrest the cell cycle when it recognizes DNA damage, and it can initiate apoptosis if DNA damage is likely to be irreparable. Interestingly, people who inherit only one functional copy of the TP53 gene will almost certainly develop tumors in early adulthood. This is a disease known as leaf fraumeni syndrome. More than 50% of human tumors contain a mutation or deletion in the TP53 gene. Clonal expansions of P16 and P53 lesions have been found in cancers of skin, lung, breast, head, neck, bladder, brain, kidney, prostate, colon, stomach, and esophagus. In other words, these two genes 
are found to have mutated in a very wide and important range of cancers. Expansions of these in clones are signatures that natural selection is favoring clones that have mutations in these genes. And so here are papers that you can look up documenting such expansions of P53 and P16 in skin, lung, breast, head, neck, bladder, brain, kidney, prostate, colon, and stomach cancer. An important finding is that the genetic diversity in a pre-malignant tumor predicts progression to malignancy. So Barrett's esophagus is a condition of inflammation in the esophagus that predisposes for a cancer called esophageal adenocarcinoma. Carlo Maley and his uh, collaborators used measures for species diversity from ecology and evolution to measure how genetically diverse these clones in Barrett's esophagus were. They used a number of different clones, the Shannon Index of Diversity and Genetic Divergence, how genetically different the mutants were. And all three of these measures predicted the patients that were more likely to develop cancer. So here is the incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma, so that's the cancer resulting from Barrett's esophagus, as a function of the genetic diversity of the uh, inflammations of Barrett's, found in Barrett's esophagus. This is the number of years the patients were followed up. And what you see on the graph is the message that the patients that were in the upper quartile for genetic diversity in Barrett's esophagus uh, were also those that had the highest incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma. Those that were in the lower three quartiles were much less likely to progress to cancer. So the genetic diversity of the clonal system, the set of evolving clones, which is providing the fuel for natural selection, is also a predictor of how likely those clones will result in full-on cancer. Let's take a look at what clonal evolution looks like and how it looks in cancer. So here is a picture of clonal evolution in general. You'll note that clone A, the Basically what you see is how much of space is being occupied by a clone. Here you have clone A, clone B, and clone C. Clone A is competitively superior and it is excluding clone B and clone C and it's also including, excluding clone AC. They all pop up but they disappear because they're outcompeted by A. However, AB is superior to A and so when the B mutation arises in a cell that already has A, it spreads and excludes the others. However, the best combination is A, B, and C, and when the C mutation arises in a clone that already has A and B, it spreads. Now notice then that clone A has interfered with clone A, C, and it slowed down the spread of the C mutant because the C is not effective until B has come along. If we now look in Barrett's esophagus, here, the orange background is uh, in indicating a region of tissue where there is the inflammation of Barrett's esophagus. The gray mutants are neutral. They pop up and disappear. Then a P16 mutant arises, and it spreads and takes over. A neutral mutant pops up and, and disappears. Then there is a P53 deletion. However, the P16 mutant outcompetes the P53 deletion. The P16 then gets two mutants. It's now homozygous for deletions of P16. It spreads and takes over, and within that background, a P53 deletion arises. It is within that, stem, that set of cells that have both the P16 double deletion and a P53 deletion that esophageal adenocarcinoma arises. You notice the two pictures look fairly similar. In other words, Clonal evolution is going on, and there is a process of clonal interference that can be documented in Barrett's esophagus. You can also see that you need a sequence of mutations to get to full-on cancer. So this view now has become standard. The idea is that there are normal cells, then there are what are called driver mutations. So they're viewed as being causal 
in the spread of cancer, but it takes a sequence of them until you get a most recent common ancestor of a cell that expands and its clonal lineage manages to take over. And out of this expanded clone come some that can form distant metastases. So this has now become a standard view of cancer. It's a, it's a process of clonal evolution that requires a series of mutations and at a certain time point, a mutation will occur which allows metastasis. So to summarize, cancer starts when a combination of germline and somatic mutations produces cells that slip out of cell cycle control, increase in numbers, and acquire the ability to move and to insert themselves into tissues. Cancers are genetically heterogeneous sets of clones that are competing with each other for resources and space. This is critical. This is a critical part of how we visualize what a cancer is. It's not a single thing. It's a genetically heterogeneous set of clones. Competition among the clones generates natural selection that favors clones that can grow faster, that can disperse, and that can invade. This evolution is short-sighted and selfish. The cancer is going to die with the patient. It is not transmitted to offspring.